Um, as you all well know, today is uh, Denver's celebrating 50 years of preaching and, and ministry. And uh, in honor of that, we, uh, we got a few people to help us make a little video. Uh, so, um, so we're going to show that right now for Denver and for you. I was raised in church and outside of a little town called DeSoto, Missouri. And at about 14 years old, I felt the call into ministry. And so at that time, I started preaching when I was 15, preached my first sermon in March of 1970, for it. And then God used me the whole 20 years. I was in the Air Force to buy vocational pastor churches. And then as soon as I was out, then I started pastoring churches full time. I understand you're celebrating 50 years of ministry, and I'm very proud of you. You'll remember that song, Run If You Want To, Run If You Will, But I Came Here To Stay. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. I came here to stay. Denver and I, my brother, and a good friend of ours had a quartet called the Young Messengers Quartet. We used to sing that song. We were young back then, and we traveled all over the country singing, and doing youth revivals in Denver, you would preach your famous sermon, uh, God's Electrocardiogram. And uh, you were famous for that sermon. Uh, I'm so proud of you celebrating 50 years. Uh, you have fought the good fight and you've kept the faith. And I commend you for that. And I pray God bless you on this very special day. I'll never... Denver Copeland, what can I say about him? that hasn't already been said. Um, he was my idol. He was the first of four guys to sing together in a group called the Young Messengers. And he was the only one old enough to drive. I was like 14, Alan was 15, Denver was 16. He'd preach and we would sing and we would have such good times together. And he had uh, a car with one way Jesus on the front of it. And uh, he may still have it, I don't know. But uh, uh, he uh, meant so much to me. And I remember the very first sermon he ever preached. I don't remember what it was about. <laughs> but I remember it was called God's Electric Cordiogram. God's Electric Cordiogram. It's kind of like uh, your spiritual cardiogram that he preached about that God monitors and uh, wants us to be like and we love him very much and you're very fortunate to have him as a pastor of your church um, and I look forward to seeing him again pretty soon um, and hopefully in this life and uh, we'll uh, be praying for you and your ministry there at Denver we love you very much and your family thank you All right. yeah we worked on a lot of low-income houses so uh, had different agencies provide material and we provided all free labor and worked on over 350 homes around our church in Alaska, and then another total 1,100 and some throughout Alaska. And then in Hawaii, we did the same type of thing. We worked on low-income homes and some churches uh, there with a group called World Changers. Hey, Denver, this is John Hodge, your favorite national missionary, just in case you forgot. Just wanted to make sure you knew who I was. Hey, man, a uh, little bird told me that you were celebrating 50 years in the ministry. No way. Dude, you've been telling me for 10 years you're only 52 years old, so something's not right, right about that. Just something, the numbers are not working out on that one, dude. You might want to change your story a little bit on that one, but hey, man, I'm excited for you. 50 years, that's amazing. The amazing thing is that you and I have been hanging around together for about 20 plus years, uh, all through Alaska, all through uh, Hawaii, and uh, now in Kentucky, and man, it's been a blessing to me just to watch you and to be around you and, 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 and know your heart and know your love for Christ and know the fact that you'll do whatever it takes to reach people for the Lord. Uh, I, World Changers has been working with you all this time uh, through, these, through these years and all the different states we've been in, 
And I'm looking forward to seeing what God's going to do there in, in uh, Kentucky and Radcliffe with uh, World Changers and all the things that you do. I've always, uh, I've known a lot of pastors through my years, and uh, you're definitely one of them. Now, uh, you, uh, you are one of the pastors that, uh, that if I had to go to and, and call on to do something, I would know that you would put everything you had into it to make it happen. I've even shared with my coworkers through the years that if Denver Copeland says that he could tear down the Sears Tower tomorrow with a rubber mallet and get it all hauled off, that I would believe you and I know that it would get done. So, man, I love you and I appreciate you. It's a blessing to work with you, and, and, I've, and I've learned so much from you. And uh, just know that I love you, love Debbie, I love the kids, and, uh, and I'll be praying for you there as you continue your ministry there. And, Lord, I hope you have a whole lot more and we get to enjoy a whole lot more friendship time together. Thanks, man. I'll be praying for you today and enjoy your time, celebrate it. And um, I'll lift you up in my prayers today. And, hate I can't be there. Thanks. of preaching he has also accomplished 50 years of only working two days a week and being able to enjoy his hobbies of collecting vans and uh, building buildings so congratulations on all that hard work dad love you you have been my shepherd leader mentor advisor and I just wanted to congratulate you on your 50 years. Thank you so much for being a part of our life. I love and I miss you, Pastor Denver. And how, how do you like it here? I like it, like it a lot. I actually have a sister and brother-in-law that have attended this church for 40 years. So over time, I came to visit them and would sometimes come and preach or sing at the church. And so in 2016, I preached a revival here and that's kind of what started everything and rolling it ended up coming here in November the 7th of last year, 2016. Denver, we want to thank you for being our pastor from the Joy Class. We love you. We appreciate everything you do. And we want to wish you a happy century. Thank you for 50 years of service. Love you, Denver. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Hey, Denver, I understand this is your 50th anniversary of ministry. God bless you. You must have started out when you was like five years old because you don't look that old. But I, I just want to let you know that we appreciate all that you're doing for the Lord's work. And you know what my heart and how much I feel about you and I appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, you're one of the pioneer pastors that I've ever met. I appreciate your dedication and service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope you have a blessed 50th anniversary. God bless you. I look forward to serving God with you for 50 more years. Hey, Denver, what's happening? Uh, I heard this is your 50th year of preaching. So you started preaching when you were three. That's amazing. Hey, listen, uh, I'm proud to be called your brother. I uh, appreciate the Jesus I see in you, the passion uh, for the church, the bride of Christ. Uh, just your hunger for the Lord, for uh, reaching the lost. I'm honored to call you my friend, the people at Stifton are blessed. I uh, hope they know what they have in you. Uh, so anyway, uh, congratulations on uh, starting to preach at three, and that's 50 years, so you should be 53 by now. Hey, God bless you, friend. Um, call me if I can help in any way. Have a great day, have a great Sunday. God bless. It is my wonderful privilege to say congratulations to my dear friend Denver Copeland for 50 years in ministry. You folks know how much I love him. Never had a dearer friend, a more consistent pastor, somebody that builds the kingdom of God with all his heart all the time. I've known Denver and been good friends with him uh, for over 30 years now, and I just uh, love the heart that he's got, the way he se serves the Lord and the way he loves God, the way he serves people thankful of how much of a family man that he is, how he loves the Word of God. And I'll just tell you, uh, there's only a couple of guys in my 48 years of ministry that I would consider my own pastor, and Denver is right at the top of that list. Brother, I love you. Congratulations. Have another wonderful 50. Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome oh, your pastor, Denver Cumberland. I know we're cutting into your preaching time. I get, I get that. I got I got that. But uh, you're close. Um, we kind of we kind of made something for you here to uh, to uh, celebrate uh, 50 years in pastoring and ministering in a. Trying not to get emotional. <laughs> so this is like, I think we started out in 2000. So we've been ministering together for 20 years, almost 20 years. We could take a little break there in the middle. But um, you mean a lot more than me than um, you will probably ever know. And uh, you know, sometimes you even, uh, you know, sometimes you're almost like dad sometimes for me. So I love you. And I appreciate you. Yeah, love you. Um, but, uh. So we, we got this little plaque made for you. It says, um, I think we're going to show it up there. It says, um, it has uh, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who trust the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar high on the wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. And it says, to Denver Copeland, March 8th, um, 2020, in honor of celebrating 50 years of preaching and ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ from Stithian Baptist Church. Then we got this preacher down here, and I don't know if you know this here, but down at the bottom, we got some shoes over there to the side. So he, he's barefoot, and I uh, says, uh, then he said, do not come near to here. Remove your, hand, your sandals from your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. Exodus. Love you. I wasn't expecting any of that, and uh, I really appreciate it, though, and some of those guys that were on that screen have meant more to me in my ministry than just about anybody else, and um, it's kind of cool when you know them that long and they still talk to you, and uh, and so uh, I want I want to tell you I, I appreciate that, and the reason 50 years became a big thing to me we're living in a day where people don't stick with anything and I believe we have to stick with it and I believe in ministry you got to stick with it and uh, the stats are and you've heard these a couple times from me before somebody getting out of seminary today and going into full time service in five years will not be remembered 80 percent excuse me 70 percent in five years that means only 30% of them graduating today will be in ministry five years from now. In 10 years from now, only 20% of them will be in ministry. And the ones that started at an early age and make it to the age of retirement, only 10% will be in ministry. Now, I'm not saying that I got here easy. It didn't happen that way. I'm going to give you a couple little examples in a minute, but... The truth of the matter is that God has blessed me, God has been with me, and even as messed up as I am, God still is with me. And so uh, I praise God for that. I started preaching, as a matter of fact, March the 8th, 1970, my first sermon. The guys in the quartet wasn't there for that one. It was a little bit later when I had that, (laughs) that that sermon them guys all still talk about. I don't even remember it. So... I know I preached it in probably 50 churches, but I, I don't even remember what passage I used. And so uh, that one's kind of funny to me. I do remember this passage, the first one I used in my first sermon, because at 17 years old, I pretty much knew everything. And, uh, and so uh, I decided since it was a country church and, and most of them in there were family and I knew them pretty good, I would just go ahead and cover all their sins. And, and I did. And I, I don't recommend that to anybody. And uh, I never will forget afterwards, uh, my, my best friend growing up, has gone on to be with the Lord. His dad was our pastor, and he put his arm around me, and he said, son, I'm going to have to look at what you're preaching next time. I think he was in fear of losing his job. I'm not too sure. But uh, I just, I love the Lord, and I love to preach. I love everything about God's work. I'm not one of those guys who run away from it. I like to run into it. My dad always told me growing up, there's two kind of people. There's some that lean away from work and some that lead into work. And you need to be 
one that leans in to work. And I've never forgot that. And I've always tried to lean in to God's work and God's ministry. Younger days, singing in quartets and preaching revivals, I'll just tell you the truth. First revival we preached, I was 16. We started singing in a different quartet, two of us did, uh, back when I was 13. And then when I turned 16, actually when I was 15, a little while we sang, and a lady that played piano for us is the one that drove us everywhere. And then when I turned 16, I drove everywhere, uh, which was a miracle we made it then. And so... Uh, but, but preaching revivals all over the Midwest and, and weekend revivals and singing at all those services with the quartet. The first one, though, we got to call. We, it was in a little bitty country church, and we were called if we'd do a revival. Matter of fact, my pastor was called, and he said, well, my son and another young man, you know, have started preaching, and I think they get, you wanted a young person to revival. And so we went into this church down in the valley, just like all the little country churches you see. And I never will forget it. Every person in there had hair this long. And that was okay. But in 1970, that wasn't too big a deal. But everyone in there only wore pullover sweatshirts with the sleeves and the neck cut out in a V. And they were all a bunch of hippies that got saved. And, those, and so these guys loved the Lord but didn't know anything about the Lord. They all came out of drugs. And we preached in that revival and sang in that revival. Those guys loved us so much. And that car they're talking about, that's where it got painted. We painted that car with Jesus saved and one way Jesus. And I drove that car uh, until I drove it in the ground. But uh, it was one of those cars that uh, everybody recognized. And to be honest, I probably didn't have any business advertising God that way. By the way, my life didn't look that way all the time. And so... Uh, those guys, we'd go to those revivals and sing and, and preach. But we, when we had first revival, we didn't have enough sermons, Rick Ferguson and I. And Rick was a mega pastor uh, and preached in churches. Uh, his last church in Denver probably ran about five to 7,000. They started 27 or 29 uh, church plants in the area that all ran over 300. He served at Southern Baptist Convention as vice president and many other areas. But he's the one that we started preaching. But neither one of us had enough sermons to even make it through a weekend revival. You see, you don't understand what it is trying to make a, get a sermon up when, when you're young. It takes weeks, it seemed like. I don't know if it did. But so, I, so we'd made this agreement. I'd preach one time, you lead the music. You preach and I'll lead the music. And we'll keep doing that. And we'll have the quartet sing every, every service. And we did that for a few years. And, and God blessed it immensely. So uh, that's kind of how I started out. When I first started out in churches and pastoring in churches, my first pa uh, time on a staff, I was 18 years old, and uh, on a paid staff, and in a church in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church. It doesn't exist anymore. I don't know if it's at my, that was my fault or not, uh, but it doesn't exist anymore. And, and I remember, and I really believe to this day, because I understand pastors, and I've done it myself, I believe the money that I was paid was out of the pastor's pocket. I don't think it was out of the church. I think it was out of the pastor's pocket. The reason I know that is because any time cash is pulled out from me, it's mine. It's, you know, that I give out. It, it isn't the church's. And so I got paid from that church and was going to college and, and working 40 hours a week and working 20 hours a week in a church and taking 21 hours of school. I didn't make it. <laughs> Two semesters of wore me out. Went in the Air Force, said, man, I'll get out of this. I'll uh, go in the Air Force, and then after I spend my time in the Air Force, they'll pay for my school, and I'll be okay. Went in the Air Force, got to my first duty station, and I went into the associational office, and back there they called us preacher boys. I said, I'm a preacher boy. I, I, if you got anybody that needs anybody to preach, just let me know. I would love to preach. Next Sunday, I started preaching in churches. It wasn't too long. One of them called me as their pastor, and I, I pastored that whole time in the Air Force. Uh, the, and pastored several different churches. Some of them became fairly good-sized churches. Most of them helped call a full-time person when the military moved me on. And so uh, God has blessed my ministry. I've, I've seen churches grow. I, I've, uh, I've seen churches grow from anywhere to two or three times to as many as 11 times the size that they were when we got there. Um, I, I'm in the older part of my life now. We haven't seen that kind of growth yet. I say yet, because I still believe God didn't put me here without a reason. 
and I believe it's going to happen. I believe in God, and I believe in what he's doing. I believe in you all, and that you are going to invite people, and God's going to take care of us. And so I don't know how it's going to happen. I never have. Never, I've never pretended to know how it happens. But I do know this. God bless us. And the sermon I'm going to preach today is, uh, don't worry, be happy. You guys all know the song. I'm going to go through these verses pretty quick and talk about them. But in verse 19 of chapter 6 of the book of Matthew, God's word reads, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eats through them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in or steal. By the way, this isn't really the time for it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Can you put up that little video real quick of, of we had a trailer stole from the church just a little over a week ago. I would like for all of you to go to our Facebook at Stitton Baptist Church, and I would like for you to share that until somebody reports who it is. Can you pull that up there without too much? I know you had it earlier, but if you'll take that off, I'll talk about it just a little bit. Uh, but then I'm going to ask the ones that watch this next Sunday night on TV, if you would go to Stitton Baptist Church Facebook and you would share it. Uh, I really would like to see either that trailer return, no questions asked, or that person to get to talk to the police about it. So uh, there it is. There's the person. There's the car. Spread the word, would you? You see, I got a problem. I don't, people steal from me. I get a little nervous, get upset. People steal from God. I get right down mad. And so, you see, because even though our treasures aren't supposed to gain, you can go back to those verses when you're ready there, the verse 20, if you would. Um, even though we have a lot of this junk on this earth, this junk on this earth is not supposed to be what controls our lives. Now, it'll make us happy for a little bit. Some things will make us happy for a little while. But our treasures are not supposed to be stored here on earth. So just let me ask you, please don't raise your hand, but how many of you think that what you have on this earth is going to be in heaven with you? Hopefully in your right mind you know better than that. The problem is nobody would want this junk in heaven. See, because what you and I will have in heaven so far surpasses anything we've ever seen on this old earth. But yet we keep storing up junk here on this earth. Can't let go of it. Can't get rid of it. It's junk. It's not going with us. Nobody else wants it. I know we all think everything we got is better than anybody else's and everything we got everybody else wants, that's baloney. It's not true. But God's word says, don't just store your treasures here on earth. Store them in heaven. All right, so what kind of treasures are stored in heaven? It's very simple. What's going to go to heaven? We are. People that know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, we're going to go to heaven. Not in these old bodies. We're going to have new bodies. Praise God. Not in these bodies that are ugly and you look in the mirror and wonder where that happened or when that happened. Matter of fact, I'm getting to the age when I look in the mirror, I see my dad, and it scares me to death. <laughs> Never thought I'd look that way. Truth of the matter is, though, you and I are not going to take anything to heaven with us except souls that we have helped come to know Jesus. So my question today is, how many of you helped to come to know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior? How about this? On this old, in this old life, my wife is my greatest treasure. Boy. And I want to tell you, the great thing that I know is she's going to be in heaven with me. Yeah. Not only her, but family members that are going to be in heaven with us. Our in-laws, my in-laws. Our children. I know they're saved and going to be in heaven. Most of our grandchildren are saved. There's a couple I'm not sure about. But I'm still praying that they'll come to know Jesus. So I think you're going to agree with me today that a treasure we should want to go to heaven with us 
would be family. And then it would be friends. Then acquaintances. And to be honest, it should be anybody we come in contact with. So why do we spend so much time and so much effort in the things of this world whenever we should be spending our time and effort to bringing people to Jesus? Because that's where it's at. It says, store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. You see, treasures in heaven cannot be taken from you. Treasures in heaven can never be taken away. This old junk on this earth can be just like that trailer that somebody backed up and the scoundrel stole and drove off thinking he got away with it and I hope he never gets away with it and if he's lost, we can't do anything to him. But if he ever has come to know Jesus, I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit can start convicting his heart. You say, well, I'm going to pray that God gets through to him and lost. Hey, he can't go to hell anymore and he's going to hell today. And neither can anybody else without Jesus. We need to store our treasures in heaven. Again, that's the things we do for God. That's the things that bring people close to God, that they see our lives. And because of our lives, they become who God created us to be in Him, and they draw near to God. See, that's where it's at. Sometimes we ought to examine what we're doing in our life to see how that affects the kingdom, not our kingdom. Verse 21 says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. That's biblical, of course, but it's an understatement. If all you look at is the things in the world, if all you look at is getting ahead, if all you look at is getting one more thing, if all you look at is getting something else, I want to tell you your eyes and your sight and everything else is going to be there and the desires of your heart are not the desires of God, but the desires of this old world. Verse 22 says, your eye is a lamp and provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. I'm just going to put it out there. It's our eyes, our sight that gets us in trouble. First of all, in this world, we see stuff we like. There's never been an affair that's happened that somebody hasn't looked at somebody and said, man, they're good looking. There's never been an affair that's happened that somebody didn't look at somebody and say, I want that. And there's other things in life that we say that, and pretty soon we start wanting what we see instead of wanting more of who we know. If our eye is like God's eyes, you and I want to see with the seeing that God has, and you and I will become closer to God, and people will see God in us more and more. Verse 23 says, but when your eye is bad, when you're not looking at the things of God, you're looking at the things of this world, that's all you think about, your whole body is filled with darkness, and if the light you think you have is actually darkness, you hear that? The light you think you have is actually darkness? How deep that darkness is. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit drive that home in your heart. Oops, sorry, I went. There we go. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I want to tell you, folks, money's not going to get you to heaven. Matter of fact, all those rich people out there, there's few, very few of them that know the Lord, and they're not happy with their lives. They're killing themselves. They're taking drugs to the point they don't know who they are. I want to tell you something. Money can never make you happy, but I want to tell you my Lord and Savior can keep you happy all the time. You see, we need to serve God in a way that we know that God's got control of our life, and I'm going to give everything I have and everything I owe belongs to God. And some of you right now say, well, that's the way I feel, but you keep your 10% from him, I'll tell you that. And I want to tell you, my life has been blessed because of giving God what he already told me to give him that was already his. Verse 25 says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. This is Jesus speaking now. 
He said, I'm telling you, don't worry about everyday life. How many of us worry all the time? I've told you this before. My mom was the biggest worry wart that I've ever seen. She worried about everything. She worried about what wasn't going to happen that she thought might happen that somebody else said they thought happened. I mean, that's the way she went through life. He said, not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Goes on to say, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them, and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Now, some of you, I know a lot of people love animals a lot, but let me tell you something. You, God created us to be above the animals. All right, that's biblical, folks. Whenever you can go to jail for killing an animal that's faster or longer than what you do for killing a person, there's something wrong in society. God is the giver and taker of life, not you or I. We go on. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Think about all the wasted time there is about worrying and fretting. Think about it. Well, if it happens, no, not if it happens. God says don't listen to it. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Matter of fact, he's going to tell you why in just a minute. Now listen, everything he's talking about is because when you and I live a holy life before a holy God, God will take care of us. Now, if you're not living for the Lord, don't expect God to bless you. Doesn't work that way. Can all your worries add one single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. And, and yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? <coughs> and don't worry about these things, <laughs> saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? Some of you right now, Satan's already working in your mind. You're saying, oh, that's not the things I worry about. No, the principle is here, don't worry. The principle here is not to worry, period. The principle here is to be faithful to God and faithful in the things of God so God can bless you. And when God blesses you, you don't have to worry. All you got to do is trust God because our faith is too small and we need to have the faith to trust in him. Goes on in verse 32 and says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. You hear this? People that know Jesus shouldn't be, their thoughts shouldn't be dominated by these things. Why? Because that's what lost people think. That's the way the unsaved think. That's the way people that are not Christians think. Therefore, if we're thinking that way and we claim to be Christians, we're not right with God because we're not thinking the way God has told us to think by his word. But your heavenly Father already knows all you need. I like trusting God for stuff. You know why? It turns out better than I always think it will. Sometimes it turns out the way I dream it would. But I can tell you this, when you truly trust God, and truly have faith in God, God will take care of you. Verse 33 says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Hear that? Seek God. Study in James. Draw close to God so that God can draw close to you. Seek God more than anything else. Not all the junk in this world, but the things of God. Seek him above all things else. And live righteously. It means live by his word. Live according to the word of God. If you do that, it says, and he will give you everything you need. Not everything you want. 
because we got a bunch of messed up wanters. We really do. I want this. I want that. Give me this. Give me that. We're, a bunch, we're like a bunch of kids in a grocery store. Why do you think they put that candy down there right in the front? Why do you put that other stuff down there the kids want? So those kids will throw a fit. You'll buy it for them to keep their mouth shut instead of busting their tail. I mean, excuse me. And I know some of you don't believe in that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you don't believe in that. But they put that candy down there. And those kids start throwing a fit. So you don't know how to control them because you never control them any other time in their lives. And so now you've got to buy it for them because after all, that's what you do is buy it for them to keep their mouth shut. Let me tell you something. If you let a little child play that game with you, you will never get away from playing that game. I know some of you didn't think this was going to be about kids. Guess what? They're like little puppies. They're cute when they're little, but they grow up. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Praise God. Be righteous before a righteous God, holy before a holy God. Cling on to the things of God and then God can bless you. Quit trying to get blessed by everybody else and everything else and let God bless you. Some of us are always saying, well, I, I live my life for the Lord. Baloney. If you're living your life for the Lord, you don't have to tell anybody what you've done. Everybody knows what you're doing because they seek Jesus in you. Verse 34 says, so don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Isn't that true? You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Because when you get up in the morning, it's going to be today. And whatever's there is going to be there. It says today's trouble is enough for today. Why don't you focus on getting through today? Just, why don't you try this? Why don't you focus on giving today to the Lord? And then focus on what God would have you to do about the things for today. It works. It's not something foreign. It works. As we look at God's word today, I want to tell you there's times in my life when we haven't had much. There's times in my life when I first started preaching and pastoring. I'll just be honest. My, th my tithes and offerings sometimes was two and three times what the church gave me. But you see, it wasn't about that. It's about God and serving God. And it's not about what you get back because God will bless you. And if you're doing it to get something back, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You didn't know that even though I came here, when you called me for pastor, I didn't want to know what the salary package was. Didn't want to know. Why? Because that's God's job to take care of me. And we came here with about somewhere between forty-five and 50000 less money than what the place we left a year. Think that was a problem? No. You know why? Because God takes care of it. And the church was very gracious after the first year and helped make some of that up. But the truth of the matter is, money's not everything. Serving God is everything. Yes. Giving your heart and life totally over to God is the greatest thing that you and I can do. And I'm not just talking about asking Jesus to come in our life so we can spend eternity with him in heaven. I'm talking about saying, Lord, I want what you want more than anything else in my life. Now let me tell you, the Bible is very clear. It says if you don't work, you don't eat. You've got to do your part. Don't get me wrong. You don't, don't sit on the mountain and say, oh, Lord, take care of me until you come again. That has not worked for any group yet. Just want to tell you, in case you didn't know. But let me tell you what does work. Saying, Lord, I'm going to do everything within my power to serve you with my life. And I'm going to work hard, Lord, in this old work so that I can honor, to, honor you as a Christian, Lord. 
so that people see me, they'll see you. And then, Father, I'm going to trust everything I have to be yours and to give you the glory, not hoard it for myself. Those are tough things. They're not easy at all. They're rough. But let me tell you, who do you want to honor the most? Somebody else? Anybody else? Even your family? Or is it going to be God? I don't know about you, but I want to honor God more than anything else. Believe me, it's not because of me that I'm still in ministry in 50 years. It's because of God. Because God took this worthless soul. And when I would ask him to, he forgive me of my sins. Restore me to himself that I might become more like him. And I got a long ways to go. But guess what? We all do. So why don't we make that journey together? Why don't we get so close to God that lost people can't stand to be around us? Some of you right now say, well, lost people can't stand to be around me now, but some Christians can't either, so you might want to consider what that looks like, all right? <laughs> Truth is, when you and I really get right with God, God will show us things we've never seen before. I don't know about you, but don't you want it? I want more of it. I've seen God walk in whenever it was destitute. I've seen God walk in whenever our lives, we didn't have anything. I've seen God walk in whenever it didn't seem like we knew what was, tomorrow was even going to bring. I've seen God walk in on almost every situation. I could spend hours just telling you the blessings that God has given us in our lives. It's not because we're some strong Christians and some real spiritual families. It's because we do try to live by God's word. And if you want what God wants for you, start living by this, drawing close to him so that God can draw close to you. If you're here today and you don't know my Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, you can come and receive him today because you see, it's not about anything we've done. It's about everything that he did. He sent his son to die on the cross of Mount Calvary that we might be saved. And if we ask him, he'll come into our heart. He'll forgive us of our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then a life starts with him that we need to live it for him. That is not just a one-time thing. That starts an everyday walk with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, Christian, how's your everyday walk been with Jesus Christ? What are you holding back from God? And I'm going to tell you, anything in this earth, it's sin. Let's give it over to God. Give God the glory. See what God's going to do. Just a moment. Corey's going to come lead us for invitation. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I'm going to say a short word of prayer. And then I'm going to ask you just to step out. And just come and do whatever God's asking you to do. Maybe that's just come and pray. Maybe that's to rededicate that life. Maybe it's to join this church and make this church your church home. Whatever it is, obey the Spirit promptly and come today. If you don't know my Jesus, I beg you today. Come and receive him in your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts and lives and hone in on our hearts today. Father, I want to thank you for everything you've done in this service today. And Father, it humbles me to, to know the time was spent in to get information from friends. And Father, I thank you for that and praise you for that. Praise you for those that did that and got it together. Thank you for those friends, Lord, that have been friends for many years. Father, I just want to praise you for who you are. Father, I give you all the glory and all the praise. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Would you step out and come as we sing?